Hey there, Mr. Weaver here, and this is Module 9, Lesson 1, Exponential Functions. After this lesson, you need to be able to recognize situations modeled by linear or exponential functions, and graph exponential functions showing intercepts and end behavior. Let's learn. Identifying exponential behavior. An exponential function is a function in the form of y equals a times b to the x power, where in this, a cannot be 0, because you can't start with 0, and that's what a represents. B is going to be greater than zero, and b cannot be one, because if you keep multiplying by one, nothing's changing. Some examples of exponential functions are y equals two times three to the x power, y equals four to the x power, and y equals one half to the x power. In those last two, the a value is just one, so really one times four to the x. Next, we can see two pictures that depicts linear and exponential behavior. In the first, on the left, we have a linear graph, and we can see that here with our straight line. Linear functions, as we saw back in module four and module five, those are straight lines. They have a constant rate of change. So we can see here in the orange, every time that this function goes over two, it also went up two. Over two again, up two again. It follows the same rate of change every time. And that's one of the key characteristics of linear functions. They add or subtract the same thing each time. Exponential, on the other hand, we can see here it starts off with a little bit. Then the next time, it's about twice as far for the same amount over. And then this one went over again one, and it's twice as far again. And it went over one, and it's twice as far again. So exponential is multiplying by the same factor. So for these, you're going to see it doubling or tripling, or maybe multiplying by 1.5. Or it could be or it could be changing in the opposite direction, such as multiplying by one half or one fourth. Either way, linear functions are going to add the same amount each time, whereas exponential functions are going to multiply by the same amount each time. Example one, identify exponential behavior. Our real context here is earthquakes. The Richter scale measures the energy that an earthquake releases and assigns a magnitude to it. These orders of magnitude can be approximated by comparing them to the explosive power of TNT. Determine where the set of data displays exponential behavior. So let's look at this. We'll start from magnitude one to two. From one to two, the amount of TNT that is equals went from 0 0.6 to just six. That means that it increased by a factor of 10. So we multiplied by 10 to go up one magnitude. If this is exponential behavior, we should see that every time we go up one magnitude, we're also going to multiply by 10. So if we check from magnitude two and three, it went from six to 60. Is that multiplying by 10? Yes, it is. That is also increasing by a factor of 10. In fact, if we keep going down, every magnitude it increases goes up by 10 more. So since this is increasing by the same factor, given an equal change in magnitude, right, they went up one each time, then this set does display exponential behavior. If we weren't sure if this was exponential or maybe we thought it was linear, we can check to see if it's being added the same amount each time. So from six to 60, that went up 54. If it were to keep going up by the same amount that we add, this time though, it went up by 540. Since those are not the same adding, we can tell this is not linear. So if you're not sure, you can check one of the ways should work. And if none of the ways work, then it's not any of the functions that we're used to. Check your understanding, read through the situation, and look at the table to determine if this table shows exponential behavior. Pause the video now and complete the check. Check your answer. You should have said, this does display exponential behavior. Each time it goes up one, it is actually getting multiplied by 0 0.8. If we were to check again, it's 0 0.8 again, and then 0 0.8 again, and then 0 0.8. No matter what, it's being multiplied by 0 0.8. Since it's being multiplied by the same amount, we can say it's exponential. Let's learn. Graphing exponential functions. Functions of the form f of x equals a times b to the x, where a is greater than 0 and b is greater than 1, are called exponential growth functions. Functions in that same form, where a is greater than 0, but b is between 0 and 1, so either a decimal between 0 and 1 or a fraction, that's less than one. Those are going to be your decay functions. What these mean is if it's growing, your total is going to keep getting larger and larger and larger. Whereas if it's decaying, then your total is going to keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Both again by a factor that you're multiplying by since these are exponential functions. Another thing that graphs of exponential functions have is a feature called an asymptote. The asymptote is a line that the graph is going to approach. So usually with exponential functions, that asymptote is going to be a horizontal asymptote. So if it's a growth function, it usually looks like this and starts going up. It's going to have an imaginary line where this part of the graph over here gets closer and closer to, but it doesn't actually touch. 
That is called your asymptote. If it's a decay function, it's going to go down and keep getting closer and closer to that line, but never actually touch it. So whatever that horizontal line may be, that is called your asymptote. Usually it's y equals zero. However, it doesn't have to be. Our key concept here then is types of exponential functions. So here I have it split. This first one is exponential growth functions. For our exponential growth functions, we can see in our graph that the graph starts off low and then it starts to get higher and higher. To get these kinds of things, a is going to be greater than zero, no matter what, that's going to be your start value, but b has to be larger than one. Because b is larger than one, you are multiplying by something that's going to make the start value larger, so it's going to grow. For exponential functions, whether it's exponential growth or decay, your domain is going to be all real numbers, meaning we can plug in any value we want for x. The range, though, is going to be y is, and then this part right here, for basic ones will be greater than zero, but that is going to be where your asymptote is. So your range is going to depend on your asymptote. In this function, we have this imaginary line at y equals zero, where it would get closer and closer to zero, but not actually. And the range is your y values, and it's always above that line. So y is greater than zero. For our intercepts, the meaning here is the same as when we had our linear functions. The y-intercept is in the same spot. Where does it cross the y-axis? Right here. Where does it cross the x-axis? In this particular one, it never touches zero because that's the asymptote, so it has no x-intercept. If the graph, for whatever reason, was shifted down, it might have an x-intercept and a y-intercept, so be careful. And then the end behavior, if you remember back into previous modules, describes what is happening to the graph as you go to the left when it decreases or to the right when it increases. So as x increases, going to the right, this one is going upward, so it's increasing. As you decrease and go to the left, even though it looks like it's flattening out, it is still decreasing, but it is not going to keep decreasing forever and ever. It is actually approaching and getting closer and closer to zero, which is your asymptote. For the exponential decay functions, most of this is the same. The one difference here, your b value is between zero and one. The domain and range are the same. The intercepts are the same. This time, though, the end behavior, as the graph goes farther and farther to the right, so as x increases going farther and farther to the right, then this time our end behavior, it is approaching the asymptote, which again is zero. As it decreases though, it is increasing. So it's really just the opposite of what the growth functions were. Example two, exponential growth function. Our real context here is folding. Each time you fold a piece of paper in half, it doubles in thickness. If a piece of paper is 0 0.05 millimeters thick, then you can determine the thickness y of a piece of paper given the number of folds x with a function y equals 0 0.05 times two to the x power. Identify key features of the function, graph it, and then identify the relevant domain and range in the context of the situation. So first of all, we can tell if this is a growth function or a decay function based on what we are given. So since a is greater than zero and b, the number we're multiplying by, is bigger than one, this is a growth function. And in growth functions, the domain is going to be all real numbers, while the range is going to be y is greater than zero. As we go forward into future lessons, these two numbers are going to be pretty important for you to figure out. The number out front is going to be your start value. Notice that's what the paper started at. And the number inside the parentheses is going to be your growth factor. And that's telling you what's happening each time. So in this case, it doubled. So we're going to multiply it by two. In these functions too, if you notice, x is in the exponent. And here, x is the number of times we fold it. And that directly affects the two. So that's telling us how many times we are going to double our piece of paper, starting at 0 0.5. But we'll go more into that into future lessons. Continuing on, we need to find our key features. So the y-intercept is the value of y when x is 0. So if we were to plug in 0 for our exponent, meaning we haven't folded it at all, then 2 to the 0 power is just 1. Anything to the 0 power is 1. 1 times 0 0.5, 1 times 0 0.05 is 0 0.05. So that is your y-intercept. And then our end behavior, because it's a growth function, meaning it's going up like that, as x increases going to the right, then y is also increasing. But as it decreases going to the left, then our function is approaching that imaginary asymptote at zero. The second part to this is going to be to graph the function. So to do this, the easy way, other than using a graphing calculator such as Desmos, we need to make a table of values. So for this, when we do, we are just plugging in different values for our exponent and calculating it out. So when we do that, we just did when x was equal to zero, that was our y-intercept, so 0 0.05, which is down here. Then let's plug in other values. So negative two is 0 0.0125, so pretty far down here, pretty close to zero. 
one would be 0 0.025 about there. Then the rest of them at one, we have 0 0.1. At two, we have 0 0.2. At three, we have 0.4. And as you get larger, they're going to become easier for a little bit until they're too large to graph. Four is 0 0.8. So we can see it is getting twice as far away as it was, which is good because we were multiplying by two. Then we can plot it, which we just did, and draw a curve to model. So our exponential function would look something like that, and it will keep getting taller and taller. The last part here is to identify the domain in range. For this, we really have to think about the context. If there's no context given, then the domain and range are just based on the function. But since here we have a context, folding cannot be negative. So our domain, instead of it being all real numbers, has to just be greater than zero while the range can't be any smaller than the thickness of the paper to start, which was 0 0.05. So that would be the lowest possible value for the range. However, as we're going through this, paper cannot just be folded over and over and over because we're going to run out of paper. Eventually, we would be restricted by the number of folds, how many ever that is, and then that would result in the thickness of the paper. So as you are going through this, make sure you are really thinking about the possible values that you could plug in for x and what you could possibly get out for y. Check your understanding. Consider y equals 3 to the x power. For now, just complete part A. Pause the video and complete the check. Check your answer. So for our key features, the domain is all real numbers. The range is going to be when y is greater than 0. The y-intercept is 1. So if we were to plug in 0 for x, 3 to the 0 is 1. That's your y-intercept. And then this is really 1 times 3 to the x. 3 is what we're multiplying by. So since we're multiplying by a number greater than 1, it's a growth function, which means our end behavior is as x increases, y increases, but as x decreases, then it approaches that imaginary asymptote at 0. Now complete this next part. Read through the situation and choose the correct graph for y equals 3 to the x. Pause the video again and complete this part of the check. Check your answer. You should have said that b is the correct graph. For these, we really only have two options for this being growth, C is showing a DK model where it's going down as we go on, and D is linear. So our only two exponential growths are A and B. If we were to look closely, just picking points that you know we can see on the graph, in A, it's at 1 and 2. The next point is at 2 and 4. What happened to it? It was multiplied by 2, and now it's at 3 and 8. What happened? Multiplied by 2 again. We don't want multiplication by 2. We want multiplication by 3. So it's not A. If we were to check and maybe even approximate where things are, here 3 looks like about halfway between 0 and 50, so maybe at 25, whereas 4 looks like it's about halfway between 50 and 100, so 75. How do you go from 25 to 75? That would be multiplying by 3. And if we took the 75 and multiplied that by 3, we're going to be up here around 225, which looks like it could be about there. So B is the correct showing 3 to the x power. Last part, describe the relevant range in this context. Pause the video one last time and complete this last part of the check. Check this last part. For this one, our relevant range would be 1, 3, 9, 27, 81, and so on. Because each person is telling three other people, then we're really only going to have multiples of three going on. So one person tells three, then that person tells three, and so on. And it keeps spreading that way. So we're not really going to have 2 or 5 or 7, those kinds of numbers, because it's not on the multiple of 3. Example 3, exponential decay function. Our real context here is caffeine. The half-life of a substance describes how long it takes for the substance to deplete by half. The half-life of caffeine in the body of a healthy adult is approximately 5 hours, meaning that it takes 5 hours for the body to break down half of the caffeine. Suppose an energy drink contains 160 milligrams of caffeine. The amount of caffeine, y, left in your system after x hours is modeled by the function y equals 160 times 1 half to the x over 5 power. Identify the key features of the function, graph it, and then identify the relevant domain and range in the context. So first, as we did in the previous one, we can see our a value here is where it started. That's how much caffeine the energy drink has to begin with. We are multiplying by 1 half because it says it takes half away. This time, if you notice, our exponent is x divided by 5. This is because it takes 5 hours for it to do half. So any time that it takes more than 1 hour or more than 1 cycle, you would write it as a fraction similar to that. So if it took 3 hours to do half of it, you would do x over 3. Because when we plug in, let's say 1 hour there, that's only completing 1 fifth of the half. If we, After 3 hours, it would be 3 fifths of the half, and so on. So as we're doing this, 
this function, first of all, is a decay function because that half is going to make our total go down. In decay functions, the domain is still all real numbers and the range is still y is greater than zero because we won't be able to ever have a negative amount of caffeine, so it would be greater than zero. For our key features, our intercepting is still the value of y when x is zero, so if we plug in zero, so zero out of five is zero, so to the zero power, still one. 160 times one is 160, so that is your y-intercept. If you didn't realize in these last two examples that in these basic exponential functions, your y-intercept is going to be your start value. Next, let's graph the function. So just like we did before, let's plot some points by plugging in values for x. So we know our y-intercept is at 160 up here. Then let's figure out the rest. So if we could go backwards an hour before this happens, which doesn't even make sense in the context, it would be at 184, so up a little higher. If we're plugging in our next values, we got 139, and then 121, 106, 92. And then finally, after five hours, is where it's half of what it was. Because that was its half-life. So four is 92. I'm going to plot that about here. Five somewhere is 80. We would want to keep going. So 10 would be half of 80. So 10 would be about 40. 15 hours would be half of 40, so 20. 20 hours would be half of 20, so 10. And we can see it's going down and down and down. And it will keep getting closer to zero as the hours pass. Last, identify the relevant domain and range. So as we just saw, and I said before, time can't be negative. So our domain here really is just our x values that are bigger than zero. And since we can't have negative caffeine, our range is really just the y values between zero and 160. 160 was the most we could have since that was what was in the energy drink. Zero is the least that we could have. 